Hey, good evening. It's time for Hank the Cow Dog again. The original adventures of Hank the Cow Dog. And it's going to be a challenge tonight. You see, my buzzards can't turn the video screen, so I'm not sure how everything's going to happen. But, uh, chapter six Buzzards. I made my way north, away from the headquarters and up into the canyon country. If a dog was going to get back to the wild, this was the place to go. Funny how it felt good walking away from everything, the job, the responsibility, the constant worry. When I crossed the road there by the mailbox, I felt free for the first time in years. On the other side of the road, I stopped and looked back. Drover had followed me out, oh, about a hundred yards or so, and then he stopped. He was watching. I, I was wondering that maybe, uh, maybe he thought I would change my mind, uh, that I would come back. Maybe he was waiting for me to tell him to come on. I didn't. I ran my eyes over the ranch one last time, the one I'd protected for so many years, and waved farewell to Drover and went on my way. I wondered how Loper and Slim and Sally May would uh, think and remember me when they figured out that I'd resigned and moved on. I had no idea, but I kind of had an idea that they would be sorry. They'd realize how they'd done me wrong and misjudged me and accused me of terrible things that I did not do. I mean, all I did was eat a dead chicken, and the chicken wasn't any more dead when I started eating it than when I finished eating it. Maybe they'd cry. Why not? A lot of people cry over their dogs. They tell me that when Lassie and Ren 1010 were on TV, that people used to cry when they thought Lassie was in a jam and she possibly wouldn't get out. Or when old Ren 1010 was, got chewed up by a bear and they didn't know if he's going to pull, pull through, people would cry. People never realize how just important a dog is until it's too late. And life will get yelled at and cursed and kicked around, but when we're gone, people wish we were back. Yeah, they'd cry when they found out that old Hank had moved on, and they'd cry even harder when it dawned on them that they were ranch was being protected. I mean, so-called protected by Pete the barn cat and Drover the chicken-hearted. They would wring tears out of a bod dog post. Yep, they'd cry. They'd say, Oh, I wish we had Hanky back. He had his faults, but he was a good, honest dog. It just won't be the same around here without him. Around sundown, they'd walk out into the pasture, call out, Here, Hank. Come here, Hanky. Here, boy. And you know what? I'd be up there in them canyons, eating fresh meat instead of co-op dog food, listening to the sounds of nature and enjoying pure peace and freedom. I'd hear them calling my name, begging me to come back, but I wouldn't go. They would had their chance. I tried to live, go straight and live by the law, but they drove me out and drove me to these drastic measures to follow the Owl Hoot Trail and become an outlaw. Next morning, they'd get up in the pickup and start driving around, checking all the spots I used to hang out. The sewer, the gas tanks, the corral, the creek. But I wouldn't be there. Then they'd drive over to the neighbors. Anybody seen Hank? We've lost our cow dog. No? Well, we're offering a $500 reward for anybody who finds him. Then they'd start driving through the pastures, honking the horn and calling, Hank, 
Here, boy. Come on home, Hanky. We miss you. We're sorry for all the injustice we've ever done. Well, we'll do anything. We'll do anything if you'll just come home. I'd hear them laying off in the canyon, peeking through the rocks. I'd see them drive across the pasture, but I wouldn't go back. Injustice had changed me, turned me bitter, and snapped something inside me. Anyway, that's what I was thinking about when I turned my back on the ranch forever and hit the old Owl Hoot Trail. They say you're not supposed to feel good on someone else's misfortune, but I got to admit it gave me considerably wicked pleasure to know that I'd left them weeping, and that with me gone, the ranch was going to fall apart real quick-like. That's the kind of satisfaction that a dog food and a flea collar can't buy. Must have been late afternoon when I reached the wild country up near the head of one of those canyons. It was pretty hot down there, not much breeze. The canyon walls rose up a hundred feet or so in the air. A couple of buzzards floated in the sky overhead. I was pretty tired, and my feet were kind of sore from walking on all those rocks, so I found a little spring of water. I jumped in and rolled around. It was pleasant, but not nearly as satisfying as rolling around in the sewer. That's one thing about my old life that I was going to miss. I always look forward to in the middle of the heat of the day. I could, Me and Drover used to go down to a place where the septic tank overflowed, We'd hop in, splash around with our paws in the air, then we'd get out and have a good old-fashioned shake. <laughs> oh, you can say what you want about spring water, but if you ask me, there ain't nothing so refreshing as good old natural septic tank water. And I always like the deep, rich, manly smell of it. A dog ought to smell like a dog. And I never had no desire to be one of them town dogs, get their hair clipped and their toenails painted and get sprayed all over that stinking perfume stuff. Perfume gives me a headache. It stops up my nose. Anyway, that spring pool wasn't as refreshing as the sewer would have been, but I managed to cool myself down and satisfy my thirst. I wallered around in it for about 15 minutes. And when I was ready to get out, I noticed I had some company. Those buzzards had been flying overhead. Well, they decided to drop in for a visit. Two of them. They were perched on the ground near the edge of the pool, staring at me. I showed them some fangs right away. I mean, I try to be friendly and all, but there's just something about a buzzard that just don't sit right with me. Maybe it's because they're so ugly. Oh, looks ain't everything in this life unless you happen to look like a turkey buzzard. And then it's pretty crucial. It's hard to be friendly to something that ugly. I gave them a growl and they bent their necks forward and stared at me. Then Wallace, the older of the two, said, Maybe... Maybe, just maybe, we thought maybe you were dead. Thinking like that, birds will get you into trouble. Now run along, I got things to do. They didn't move. So I stepped out on dry land, shook myself off, throwed water over Wallace, and he dropped his wings and took a couple of steps back. He ain't dead, Junior, you was wrong. I tell you, Papa Paul, he's the dead. I just know he he is. Junior seemed to have a little stutter problem. When I pick up a signal, I, 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 something's the, the dead. Remember that squirrel, the ground squirrel? I picked him up at 500 yards, and what did you say? Wallace frowned and squinted one eye. I don't recall what I did I say. You, as I said, I was seeing things. Uh, you said my eyes was hooked up to my ba 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 belly. Uh-huh, it's coming back to me now. 
And you said, I didn't have enough experience. When I got as old as you, maybe I'd amount to, to something. I was just trying to be optimistic, son. You can't blame me for that. Wallace burped, and the whole stinking canyon turned sour. Dang, I'm hungry. I'm telling you, Paul, he's dead. I picked up the signal again. They moved a little closer and looked me over. Junior, if he's dead, how come he crawled out of the watering hole? Bubba beats me. And how come his eyes are open and he's looking back at us? Uh, beats me, but he, he's dead. May so, son. I never claimed to know everything, but you did too. Yesterday morning. All right, all right, I take it back. Hey! His head shot up in the air. I'm starting to pick up signals too. You're right. He is dead. I told you so. They came toward me. I watched them and I lifted my lip up on the side. Whoa, whoa, Junior. Did you see that lip go up? Did you see them teeth? Look there, son. Look, what, what am I saying? Junior stretched out his skinny neck and studied me for a minute. That, that, that don't mean nothing. Uh, I'll p prove it. And with that, Junior marched right up and pecked me on the top of the head. As you might imagine, I didn't care for that. Uh, and I, so, I took a snap at Junior and relieved him of a couple of dozen handfuls of feathers. The buzzards ran for cover. The old man tripped over a rock and went down, hopped back up, kept going, looking over the, his wing the whole time. I told you he wasn't dead. But, Paul, I told you once, I told you twice, I told you three times, but, Paul, What's that around his neck? Huh? They came back and started looking at me again. That's where the signals were coming from. That thing around his n n neck, under his chin. Old Wallace's eyes popped open and a smile came across his face. I believe you're right, son. It, it's a chicken head. Wallace put on a pleasant face. Well, pleasant for a turkey buzzard. And came waddling over to me. Hi there. Uh, you new around here? Maybe. I'm Wallace. This here is, is Junior. Uh, I was just wondering, um, what would you take for that, that uh, chicken head? What you got? They went into a huddle. Then the old man said, Tell you what, neighbor times are hard right now. My eyes are going bad. And Junior's a little on the simple side. So, uh, we haven't had a good meal in three days. We sure are hungry. We could use a chicken head right now uh, till our luck changes. We'd have to take it on credit is the long and short of it. We do you a favor. Wallace nodded his head. <laughs> Yes, we would, uh, we surely would do you a favor. Uh, and because we never forget a good deed. 
I thought it over. Seemed to me that trading a stinking chicken head for a buzzard's goodwill was about an even swap. You couldn't take either one of them to the bank. Tell you what, boys, if you can chew the string around my neck in half, I'll give you the head. Their eyes lit up. Junior started towards me, and then the old man slapped him across the mouth with his wing. I'll handle this. You just go for further orders. Wallace waddled back, squinted at the string. He leaned out his neck and took a bite, and he got my ear instead of the string. I yelped and jumped away. I'm, I'm sorry. Dang, I'm sorry. Uh, it's my eyes. Uh, let me try again. All right, but this time leave the ear where it sits. He tried again. This time he found the string. He chewed it in half, and as soon as the head hit the ground, Junior made a dive for it and swooped it off on his beak and ran off. The old man ran after him, flapping his wings and stumbling over the rocks and things. Junior, you come back here. Junior! They fought over it for five minutes. First, Junior had it, then Wallace had it, then Junior had it again. They got so busy fighting that it fell to the ground, and a chicken hawk swooped in and picked it up, and that was the last they ever saw of their supper. You, you, you done that because you're so g g greedy. It was about dark by this time, so I found a comfortable spot, and curled up for the night. Junior and Wallace argued back and forth for another hour at least until they last they shut up. And we had some peace and quiet. I was drifting off the sleep when I heard Junior's voice. Papa? What? I'm hungry. You ought to be the way you acted. Papa? What? You ever eat d -d 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 dog? I raised my head. The first son of a buck that comes creeping around me in the middle of the night is going to get his legs tore off one by one. I didn't hear another sound out of them birds for the rest of the night, and they didn't stay for breakfast. All right, that was chapter six. Next chapter, tomorrow night at seven o'clock, another great chapter by John R. Erickson, the author of this book, True Love. So hope to see you join us again tomorrow night, and everybody stay safe. Be kind. Love one another. Thank you, guys. Bye.